Hello, how are you? Great, how are you? Good, I'm so glad you're joining us. Oh, I could not be happier. Thank oh. you. Hello. Oh. Hi there. I love it. Everybody is early today. Good to be a little early. Yes. I feel like if I'm not early, I'm late. So I am the same way. I my choose husband, early. Yeah. My husband and I have like two different times that we will like operate from. We'll either say like hunt, which is my family, which is so early or frenzel, which is my husband's family. And that is late basically. So we'll like, be like, are you in there hunt time or frenzel time? Yes. So gives an idea of what to expect. And we, we have that. We have some family members that we, we lie to. We tell them it's yes, totally. half an hour earlier <laughs> than it actually is. That's yes. Totally. I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one doing that hat. Cause I feel oh, like no. be... well, my parents were both military. So we're always early. Oh, you are. In fact, Deborah, I had, I was curious, um, your connection to Rhode Island, because my parents met while my dad was stationed in Newport, that they started their life in Newport, um, Rhode Island. So I was, with, what is your connection to, to Rhode so Island? When I met my husband, he brought me to a beautiful vacation house he has, we now have, in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, which is about 45 minutes away from Newport. Uh, Rhode Island is a minuscule state. Yes. Um, so we have a house there. And then we've restored uh, a big Victorian hotel called the Ocean House. Yes. So we have a lot of ties. And then I set my first book there. Yeah, my my all my family are from Pawtucket. Um, oh, great, great, great. Yeah. yeah. And Westerly and, and that area. But so yeah, Watch my... Hill is Westerly. Oh, yeah. Yes. Watch it. It is Westerly. I've been is, there. It, yeah. Oh, so you know. Yes. Yeah, so my husband's done some really incredible stuff in Westerly. He's restored a bookstore called the Savoy, which yes, is owned I'm... by um, Annie Philbrick, who has Bank Square Books and Mystic. I don't, you probably all know each other from sometimes we do. bookstore worlds. Um, so he restored that and that's her bookstore in Westerly. And then he did a big theater called the United, which is very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we we go to Cape Cod every summer, that's our little where we go nice. to escape the heat. And um, this year we went on a big bookstore tour, and um, we went to an unlikely story, which is close yeah. to, close to you, but are close to that area. Yeah. But everyone said you need to go to the Savoy. Oh, because, come! Let yes. me know if you're coming. Yes, oh, I will yeah. because it's it is. I've heard nothing but good things. Yeah, it's yeah. it's great. I mean, what's better than a, an independent bookstore? I just, Nothing. I mean, part of this, this tour, which has been so gratifying is going to all these bookstores mm -hmm. because to talk about like-minded people, right? <laughs> there yeah. we all are. Which ones have but, you been to, Deborah? Oh my goodness. I've been to some in Florida. I've been to some in South Carolina, Georgia. I'm trying to think of the names. Book Miser in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, I did an event, oh, with an Atlanta bookstore, but out in the country, and I can't think of her name. Foxtail, maybe, or is it I did Foxtail. Fox I went to Foxtail, but I was thinking of another one. I did go to Foxtail. It's adorable. Mm -hmm. um, oh, my gosh. I was just at Polly Buxton's store in Charleston, which mm -hmm. is beautiful. Okay. So you guys are in Waco. Yes, we yeah. are in Waco. But I would say, like, Elizabeth and I have ties to... Um, the northern states okay. so we're southern but we have tight like she said Rhode Island my family's from like upstate New York and oh, whereabouts um in I'm trying to remember the town Ithaca oh of Ithaca yeah that's beautiful yeah. there um yeah. so we are also involved in a community in upstate New York but it's in the Catskill hey. Mountains okay uh, yeah we've done an in there called the Deer Mountain Inn so it's kind of like surf and turf you know one is one thing, one is another. That uh, is so cool. And so your husband well. just restores like old. We took things. these projects on together. Um, we started with a movie theater and mm -hmm. just kind of moved on from there. Some of them have been more him, some of them us together. I don't know. It's kind of a folly. Yeah. <laughs> I like that description mm -hmm. of it. That's, that is so cool. I love that. And not everybody knows upstate New York, which is really fun for me it's such a um, it, it well yes and, and well you're in texas which is a big I mean, 
<laughs> it Texas, we it's hard to get used to states that are not Texas sized. Right. Sure. But yeah, um, Rhode Island is smaller than our county. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. That yeah. Is yeah. Well, if you're okay, we'll go ahead and start. Um, we have a good okay. amount of people here. Um, I have not gotten to introduce myself, Deborah, but I'm Allison Frenzel. I'm one of the owners here at Fabled. And um, Elizabeth Barnhill is one of our book buyers. And we're so excited to have you. This book, I was riveted. I cannot wait to talk more about it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, and if anybody in the chat, I'll, I'll just give a brief description of what we'll do. Um, Elizabeth and I have prepared questions uh, for Deborah. You may also have questions. Feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them. We may ask them because we've thought of them and we have like-mindedness with you, um, but we'll get to them as soon as we can. And then at the end of our discussion, we will announce our book for next month. So make sure you stick around. And if any point you need to like leave or do something else, put children to bed or whatever, um, don't worry because we will have a recording that is sent out about 24 hours after we end. It will send your email. So you'll receive that uh, we always seem to get emails going, where's the recording? I want to hear it. And I promise it's coming. I promise. Mm -hmm. So just trust me, it'll come and um, you'll be able to hear our whole discussion um, that we have here. And so, yeah, but we're so excited. I'll let Elizabeth formally introduce you though. Yes. Okay. So tonight we are joined by Deborah Goodrich Royce. Her thrillers examine puzzles of identity. Reef Road hit Publisher Weekly's bestseller list, Good Morning America's top 15 list, and was an Indie Next pick by the American Booksellers Association for January 2023. Ruby Falls won the Zibby Award for Best Plot Twist in 2021. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I need to look into those awards. And Finding Mrs. Ford was hailed by Forbes, Book Riot, and Good Morning America's Best of Lists in 2019. She began her career as an actress on All My Children and in multiple films before transitioning to the role of story editor at Miramax Films, developing Emma and early versions of Chicago and A Wrinkle in Time. With her husband, Chuck, Deborah restored the Avon Theater, Ocean House Hotel, Deer Mountain Inn, United Theater, Savoy Bookstore, and numerous Main Street revitalization projects in Rhode Island and the Catskills. She serves on the governing and advisory boards for the American Film Institute, Greenwich International Film Festival, New York Botanical Garden, Greenwich Historical Society, and the PRASAD project. Is that is that how I say it? Or Prasad. Prasad. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Deborah holds a bachelor's degree in modern foreign languages and an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Lake Erie College. We are so thrilled for you to join us tonight, Deborah. Um, I got to say, I always like to kind of say where, where I came up and where I found the, the book. And um, all of my reps know I have just this soft spot in my heart for mysteries and thrillers. They're always trying to help me find these books. And my Simon and Schuster rep said, you know, I think you might like this book. And I loved the cover. Oh my word, love the cover. And I thought, I'm going to give this a shot. Um, sat down to read it and read the entire book in one sitting. I loved it so much. Um, so immediately I, I told Allison, this is going to be, this, we're going to have to pick it for book club. And we've just been singing its praises for months and just so thrilled to finally get to speak to you tonight. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Allison. I am so happy to be here. It's, it is a particular thrill to talk to people about a book who've actually read the book yeah. and uh, you know, it's one thing to be on tour and do signings and that's, you know, a whole song and dance you do, but this is dear to my heart. So thank you. I love that. Well, and just to warn everyone, spoilers abound. So if you've not finished the book, feel free to, um, to X out and, and watch it later, but we will be talking about spoilers here, which I know sometimes authors, Deborah, like you don't get to, you don't get to dive into all the spoilers when you discuss a book, but we just, so you know, the plan is everybody's read it who's here. So I was at an event the other day, which was, you know, just a signing event. And this woman asked me a question, which ended with a big spoiler. And I paused for a minute and she said, what I mean by that is, and then she made it an even bigger spoiler. And I said, I actually <laughs> knew what you meant. <laughs> but yes. Let's not talk about that. Yes. So, I don't know what she was thinking. 
that has to be the hard part too of like writing a thriller is that the the when you're discussing it that someone who hasn't read it will have the story completely spoiled for it for sure right. but since spoilers abound feel free to give us an overview of the book as much as you want or as little as you want just for a review Okay, well, Reef Road is a dual narrative set in Palm Beach, Florida, in the the months of primarily the COVID lockdown of 2020. It's the story of a writer, uh, a lonely, obsessive writer, who uh, extensively researches the murder of her mother's best friend, childhood murder, and uh, all kinds of arcane murder statistics in general. Her sections are written in first person. Uh, they're very internal. They're almost like journal entries. And they tend to be, they veer toward the meta at times, very self-referential. Alternating with that is the story of a younger woman, the wife, a woman by the name of Linda Alonso, who's married to a very handsome fellow from Argentina by the name of Miguel Alonso. And about three weeks into the COVID lockdown, he disappears with their two very young children and the police find the family car at the long-term parking lot at the Miami International Airport and security camera fit footage of Miguel and the two children going through the airport and in their face masks, that's why I'm doing that, <laughs> and getting on a plane bound for Buenos Aires. And because of the pandemic, she can't follow. So the book starts to toggle back and forth between these two women who seemingly have nothing to do with one another. And of course, that is what is revealed <laughs> as time goes on. Yes. Well, and and one of the things I one of another reason I wanted to pick up the book is that the rep said there's actually a personal story here with the author, and interestingly, the um, murder that we that is talked about, and I think I've told you this, Deborah, but it was the day my dad was born. So that's kind of it was strange to keep saying December tenth, nineteen forty eight. So um, that, that's something. That so yes. My mother's best friend was murdered in Pittsburgh on December the 10th, 1948, which I can tell you was a Friday, if you didn't know that. <laughs> I know that my mom and her friend walked home from school, and there was great chatter about whether or not they would go to practice uh, of the Christmas pageant that they were in, both involved in. And Carol, the real name of her friend, uh, Carol's parents were going bowling that night, and so there was a debate, would my mother go over there? My grandmother did not allow her to go for whatever random reason. And um, so the real crime, she was murdered. She was stabbed 36 times. And it happened that night while she was home alone. Hmm. Wow. That's yeah. Um, talk about, Deborah. so the dual timelines. Um, when I was reading this, I kept being like, when are these going to come together? And there has to be very delicate dance for you when you're like unfolding the story or two stories really. And then the moment you bring them together, um, because for a moment, I don't, I would love to know if others felt this way. I was assuming the writer was you. Is there a part of you that's in the writer? I mean, I'm assuming a little bit um, mm -hmm. while it's kind of those two storylines are converging. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so my mother is alive and well, and I, for her sake, I'm telling everybody here, the writer and her mother are a lot crazier than we are. <laughs> it's a spoiler of alert. Course, if you ever run into my mother, tell her I told you that. Right. Um, yeah. So with the writer, so when the pandemic shut us down, I was here. I'm in a, in Florida, you can tell because I have a ceiling fan <laughs> that I'm in our house in Palm Beach. And it was that weird moment. We didn't know what was happening. So I started the research. And at first, it was kind of surprising how much material I was able to find on the internet. And I do not name the murder victim, but it is truly not difficult to find out if you are inclined. If you just put in you know, the actual date, you'll, you'll find it in Pittsburgh. And I, at first, I mean, talking about how the book, the, the writer sections are a little meta. I was thinking, how meta could I be? Could I really write a, a nonfiction book mixed with a fiction book? And how would that work? And it just seemed too out there. Plus, I didn't want to write this as nonfiction. I really, my goal 
was to examine the bigger truth of generational trauma or conferred trauma. We, you know, we are very much affected by these acts of violence that happen to people we love, our, our, our parents, our grandparents, people in our town. I mean, I'm sure um, people who live in a town where there's a school shooting or something, there's, there's an effect that that carries forward. So I wanted to examine the truth of that and I wasn't so much interested in the minutia of facts. For example, the real murdered girl had two brothers and that was just confusing to work with two brothers. Since suspicion really fell on the one brother, there was no point in having the second. So yeah, I but I think I put, having been an actress, you know, back at, long, long ago, I do think I approach each character from the point of, you know, what is this character's motivation and what is a piece of myself that I can access to understand. For example, I played uh, opposite Mark Harmon long ago in the miniseries, The Woman Who Married Ted Bundy. So in preparing for that, I thought, well, what, on, you know, what was she thinking? That's the question with a character like that. So that's the approach. Hmm. So interesting. Well, one of the things that's so great about this story, I think, is the setting during the pandemic. And I think, especially this week, we've all probably been thinking about, you know, three years ago, right now, I was on top of a mountain and trying to figure out how to get, how to get down to Colorado. We were actually yeah. literally walking with our suitcases down the side of a highway because there was everything was shut down. Yeah. Um, so I'm really thinking about it this week for sure. But um you said it during the pandemic. I think it was done so well. It lent this claustrophobic feel to the story. Um, you know, do you think that it could have worked in any other timeline? No. <laughs> and I think I I like to say to people who haven't read the book, this is not a book about the pandemic. We don't right. dwell on it, but it's the setting. And Alice McDermott has a new book out on writing. It's called What About the Baby? And she talks about something that makes a lot of sense. She says in nonfiction, you know, if you're a journalist, it is your job. You have to include every, every, everything right. in whatever you're writing. When you're writing a novel, because the possibilities of what you could include are actually infinite. Your job as the writer is to place a box around, to, to place walls. And I think the pandemic as a setting really served to put constraints around the characters, to put limitations on them. And for me, I, you know, I give the analogy of, if you pick up a book that's set in Paris in 1944, you know instantly what your characters can and can't do, what's pressing in on them. So it is also kind of a, a human shorthand that we have. So you know right away. Um, and so when Linda's husband disappears, how would I have stopped her from being able to follow? I mean, I'm sure I could have come up with something, but the pandemic it is very comprehensible. And you said the claustrophobic setting. It, I think, lent a kind of hothouse atmosphere, a crazy making atmosphere that we were all going through in one way or another. Yeah. Inter I have to say, interestingly, my grandmother was Alice McDermott's first grade teacher. <laughs> really? Yes. So I love all these connections. That's I know. So yeah. Yeah. My, wow. yeah. Anyway, I love, I, I want to interview her one day and talk about that. I think she actually um, dedicated one of her books to my grandmother. So, wow. Yeah. So, wow. Cool. Ah, amazing. Yeah. Well, Deborah, I would love to talk about kind of our obsession with true crime because uh, es especially as women sometimes, do you have um, any sort of like thoughts or theories about our obsession with that? I feel like this was an easy book to dive into too, if you like were into true crime. <laughs> I would love to hear more. Yeah, so I've heard different theories, but my theory is I think we, we look at true crime in a way to try to figure out what that person did that is avoidable for us in our actions. What can we do differently? How could we change that outcome? Because the nature of true crime is very random. 
primarily, and we feel like it could happen to us. But if we understand, oh, well, it was the woman's husband who killed her and I'm not married or whatever it is. Um, I think we study it in that way as something, I don't know, learning ways to avoid, I guess, mm -hmm. I would say. As if we could pick up clues that would help us avoid something. As if we could. And I have a weird story tying in with that. So I, having had this happen to my mother, I have a very active imagination. I write thrillers. I, I tend to catastrophize in my brain. My house was robbed in May last year. And what is so weird, even like I can see the thriller and anything walking into this robbed house, clue after clue after clue. I just kept normalizing what I saw. My front door was open. There was some weird scrap of paper on the porch that I had written. And I looked at this thing and I thought, isn't that funny? I wrote that in a book where I had one character say to another character, wow. If you ever come home, you know, she told the character, other character, leave a piece of paper in the door jam. If you ever come home, if it ever falls out, don't go in the house. He will be inside. And I look at it and I'm like, oh, isn't that funny? I wrote that in a book. <laughs> I go into the house. My staircase is shattered in splinters on the floor. And I call my itty bitty housekeeper. She couldn't weigh a hundred pounds and ask this very silly question. Did you fall down the stairs? Had she fallen down the stairs with the velocity to shatter the staircase like that, she'd be dead. And of course, the house was robbed, and we won't digress too far into that. But that's the kind of thing that intrigues me. So I have this certain way of thinking, except in a crisis when I should have it, and then I don't. What's up with that? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I have a question when, you know, I, I think there's, it seems like there's been this rise of citizen detectives and, and um, you know, women and men who are solving crimes even through DNA. Um, I'm curious if you have tried to solve the mystery of your mother's friend. Um, and even, I'm just curious, what do you think pushes a person um, to try to solve crimes, especially it seems like the, the type of person who was, um, who've been affected by crimes in the, themselves. I mean, I'm thinking of, um, oh, Adams, you know, I, when I was the same age as Adam who disappeared in 1980. And I know his Adam Walsh and his father yeah. trying to solve crime. So what, why do you, why do you think that is the case? Well, um, I mean, there's so many cases of that. Let's take a recent person, Michelle, McNamara. She wrote I'll Be Gone in the Dark, and she actually died in the process. She didn't take very good care of herself. And she was a citizen detective. She was very instrumental in solving the case of this Golden State killer that the cops didn't understand at all. And I think we respect it now. Back when my mother's friend was killed, there was that weird group of people running around Pittsburgh that uh, annoyed and scandalized the cops. Um, so am I called to do that? You know, I kind of pulled the punch with this and I didn't go down that path. I do know that the real case was opened in 2008, reopened uh, very much along the lines of the way I fictionalized it in the book. I have a friend who's a DA who spoke to the Pittsburgh Police Department and it did seem that there might be a 60 year old DNA conviction, which didn't pan out. So I'm not so much interested in taking that brother down. I mean, I think it's probably the brother who mm -hmm. killed her, but do I wanna go so far? I, I don't know. Yeah, right. It's a, it would be a big thing to accuse someone for sure. I, I agree. I agree. I had a bit like when I was reading it, I was reminded of the theories of John Bonet Ramsey, Ramsey that people think that it was the brother with her as well. And, and when I was researching this, I read a tome on John Bonet Ramsey, and there's a theory too that it was the mother. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Gosh. That really blew my mind. But can you, I mean, would you want to say that? Yeah, I right. I know. It's just, it's unfathomable. So it's, it's hard to even say it. 
Right. Right. Um, okay. So back to spoilers. Um, this book starts with a bang, ends with a bang. I would love to, when I was, I listened to it first and then I was, and then I was reading the book, but I was listening to it on a road trip. And when I, I heard about the severed hand, I was like, I mean, <laughs> at that, I was like in for sure. <laughs> Talk about how, um, how you start with something like that. How do you choose like how something is discovered? Yeah, and I, 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 mean, I didn't write that first. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the puzzle pieces of the death of Miguel, there were very complicated puzzle pieces that eventually led to creating that prologue. And I'm a lover of prologues, you know, people have, different feelings about prologues. I think a prologue is, is um, like a little teaser, a little intro that really sets the tone of what you're going into. So working through what happened that night, uh, you know, the, the red flyer wagon, the radio flyer. I loved writing that bit that they pulled the body down the road and the radio flyer wa wagon, um, how they would get to a boat, very complicated mechanics. We have a boat and uh, I'm not a boater, but I talk to a lot of boaters, like how far is the Gulf Stream? How long would it take a body to travel up the Gulf Stream? I love that you ask those things too, yeah. like no, <laughs> no red flags on their part. Like, oh yeah, I think a body could go this fast. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this weird person? And then the idea to, to open it with a piece of both evidence, but also this major hint that this is a very dark tale. So I worked backwards to that. And also the beaches were like that then. They had the yellow do not enter tape. It was all very much like the twilight zone, like Elizabeth, you were saying, walking down the side of a mountain that was closed and it was, Palm Beach is normally this vibrant, happy place. And it was just still like we'd all been raptured. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. Did you have any alternative endings planned? Or I, did. I, I go through different, I don't always know the ending and I go through different possibilities. And yeah, that's where we ended up. It was very good. good and I, I considered different, uh, options for Linda. I considered different options for the children, for Noel, the writer, you know, how would this all play out? I mean, really the dark horse in this is Diego, the brother, mm -hmm. very dark horse. Yeah. And I loved how it ended. It was just perfection. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, we love to talk to our authors about two things, about the title of their book. Was that always the plan? Was that something that you chose or the publishers and the cover? What do you think of the cover of the book? Well, I absolutely love the cover. And uh, we had talked about different things. One of the things, one of the options was a street sign, the Reef Road street sign. And it's a very cool street sign. And to me, it reminded me a little bit of um, the movie Sunset Boulevard. If you remember the beginning of that movie, and that's a very dark film, it Sunset Boulevard is painted on a, a grubby curb in uh, Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the name of the movie is, is revealed like that. I think um, I was very pleased with The Bird of Paradise. I'm looking at the book right now. I can hold it up. It's such a, a pretty flower. And we looked at versions with the flower in the center. And when the flower's in the center, it looks more like a really nice piece of literary fiction. Mm -hmm. And having it off to the side and the way it kind of tilts and looms. And then the spider. Spider. So, we there were many versions of the spider because when you have a spider on a book cover you don't want it too hairy or gross so people don't touch it so mm -hmm. reef road was always the name and that came from the period of writing here and i was riding my bike up and down the island looking for a street for linda alonso and i love writing real places and using real place names and you know all these streets were pretty names like Banyan or Hibiscus or Dolphin. And then Reef Road to me sounded 
not quite as extreme, but a little bit like Cape Fear, the name mm. of a place that is slightly ominous, that also indicates that things all is not well. Yes. Like beautiful, but dangerous. For mm -hmm. sure. Um, you have such an interesting bio, Deborah. When I was, um, we were reading it earlier this week, I was like, wow, it, that, <laughs> it just a robust for sure. Have you always wanted to be a writer? So I could always write going through high school, college. I could write. I was a French and Italian major. I did a lot of writing in those languages, but I didn't have the number of creative ideas I've had later. Um, you know, I was an actress then I was a story editor at Miramax. I think my years at Miramax were like my writing school. I was there in the 90s. Um, you hear a lot about Miramax these days, not good things, but it was a very creative place to work. And I felt like sitting in that editorial chair gave me what I needed to later write on my own. Um, so I was writing but quietly and sporadically and without discipline is the way I would say it. And while I was raising my kids, I was involved in a couple of writing groups. I was working, but for me, and I'm, there are a lot of women writers. I can't speak about men. I, that's a different thing. But, but <laughs> women writers who raise children and write novels at the same time, I wasn't one of them. So this, I was really an empty nester eight years ago. And as I said, I'd been writing, 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 but it was sort of the tipping point where I thought, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to declare myself and I'm going to do it at a more serious level. So that was my trajectory. And I'm older, so you live long enough, you get to do <laughs> a few things. I do like to say to younger women, I think there is this thing that younger women believe sometimes that you have to do everything at once. Mm -hmm. And I hope I stand as the poster child that you might be able to do a few things sequentially. Right. Wow. Have you, did you get to work on anything that we would know of in Miramax? Yeah. So I really brought in Emma, um, the one that Doug McGrath directed with Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, and it, you know, there is a collective unconscious and there was a moment where a lot of Jane Austen scripts landed on my desk and that was just sparkling. It just had something about it that took it to the next level. I worked on um, Chicago, not the version that got made. I worked on Chicago when Madonna was attached. I worked on A Wrinkle in Time, the children's book. And that's a story I love to tell people because, you know, we have these ideas of time that things have to happen in the timeline we would like them to happen. And the, the expansive timeline of A Wrinkle in Time, if you recall, that was a children's book written in the early 1960s. And 30 years later, it was on my desk and the writer died and it was just a terrible story. And I would have told you then nothing's ever gonna happen with that movie. And 20 years after that, uh, the black American woman director, Ava DuVernay right. made it with a multiracial cast. And it was very inspiring and humbling because I thought, wow, you just, you just don't know the life of a, a piece of art. and. It has a life beyond us. So hold that thought. Yeah, that's so great. Um, I know that you like to say that you write identity thrillers. Um, can you kind of explain uh, that that micro genre to us? And is that, are those really the stories that you're, you're mo most drawn to? Do you ever think you might do something different than a mystery thriller? Well, I do. In fact, I don't know if I will write that always. I mean, I have had the blessing to be able to write three very distinct books. Uh, not one follows on the other. Not one follows a formula. A body of work that I would aspire to would be the cinematic body of work of someone like an Alfred Hitchcock or the literary 
body of work of someone like a Joyce Carol Oates. Mm -hmm. What I love about Joyce Carol Oates is she writes what she wants to write and she jumps around. And I just, I read widely. I read mostly fiction, uh, but I certainly don't read all thrillers. And um, a good book is a good book. And I, I don't, I, I use that term identity thrillers mainly to indicate that I'm not really following a formula. I mean, Reef Road is an unusual book. You're, mm -hmm. you know, what it does. And there was a while where I thought, I don't know if anybody's going to get this book. And I'm so pleased that people get it. But it's a reminder that at a certain point, you just have to do what you're called to do. So will I always be called to write that kind of book? I don't know. And plus, I've really managed in my first three books to have a pretty big plot twist. And will I always be able to do that? I don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I have to say, I, this is one of my favorite genres. I, I read pretty widely, but um, I, I've, I want more books like Reef Road that are propulsive and interesting and mysterious, but also really smart. Um, I will say, this at the minute I finished the book, I texted my friend Sarah from Sarah's Bookshelves. I know you got to talk to her. A couple yeah, of, I did. I got, yeah, um, and and we both kind of have a, a similar love of this genre. Yeah. It's like Sarah, you've got to read this book. It's so smart, and I know she that was one of her favorite books too. So yeah. um, I want just wanted to say bravo, and we just we we definitely I would love to have more books like it because it was. Pretty well, and people get thing. boxed in. It happens in the movie business. It's it happens in in the uh, literary business that pe people get really boxed in, and it it takes some courage and freedom in other ways, uh, maybe financial freedom to sometimes take risks like that, which is a privilege. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, I would love to hear more about authors that inspire you, especially like Elizabeth saying your writing is really smart and that you're trying not to always live into uh, that plot twist. I, you just reminded me of like M. Night Shyamalan, which his love movies him. were so great. I was even talking to someone about him today and I know he's done like a new movie that's kind of different, but I was like, I wondered if he felt so pigeonholed that he always had to do like that type of movie where you're surprised. Mm -hmm. um, right. That's a lot of questions. And that was sort of why I brought up Hitchcock because if you look at his body of work and I don't much care for Psycho or or some of the later ones, but he just always had that wit and humor and uh, just the, the, the unfolding of what the mystery was was so flawless. But some writers, uh, oh gosh, whom I love it. Well, Joyce Carol Oates, I brought her up. Uh, when that... Uh, was it a mini series or I guess it was a mini series of Blonde came out. I thought, well, I'm going to finally read that 700 page book. And it's an extraordinary book. I hadn't tackled it before. It's worth reading. I, I think with that book, there's a reason she calls it Blonde and not Marilyn or not Norma Jean, because it really is about the archetype of, mm -hmm. of that girl, woman, you know, what's done to her, this, how she's projected upon. Uh, I, I love that. Alice McDermott, I, I mentioned her earlier. I love her books. Uh, I love Elizabeth Strout. What I like about her, I find, oh, I like many things about her, but one of the things that I love about her, I find her language odd. <laughs> now, what I mean by that, I think we listen to people and we often listen to people who speak in a similar rhythm, cadence type of expression that we have. And she veers from that for me. So sometimes I have to reread a sentence like, what did she just say? Um, and I find it very enchanting. What else have I been reading lately? Well, I always mention uh, Nancy Mitford. I am one of those people who rereads about every four or five years, Pursuit of Love and Love in a Cold Climate. And they're just, I don't know, they're this weird kind of comfort world for me, this kind of big, messy, raucous uh, English family. Um, so 
I, I do read all over the place. I love for thriller writers. I love Tana French very, very, very much. I love The Witch Elm and I love The Searcher. Anyway, I've given you some examples. Oh yeah, well, we <laughs> could take all of them as we mm -hmm. also love authors and love books. So that's so great to hear. Well, we always like to ask, what are you uh, working on next? Do you have an, another book in the works or just kind of in, in thinking stage right now? Yeah, so I've started noodling with something. I got this, uh, you know, ideas come from funny places. And I got an email from a man who said, remember me? And I'm thinking, hmm, not yet. And he said, I was your best boy in survival game which I love as a sentence, just in and of itself. So a best boy on a movie is the head electrician. And Survival Game was a movie I did some years back, many years ago. So I still don't remember him. He goes on to say, remember that Thanksgiving dinner we had together? You were no. the only actress that nobody visited. And I'm thinking, I really don't remember a Thanksgiving dinner with this guy. And also, why didn't anybody visit me? And then he goes on to say, do you remember when we ran into each other at the Cannes Film Festival and you were holding a baby and waving at me? And I wondered for a moment if the child was mine, but I knew that wouldn't be possible. And by that point, I'm thinking, wow. I mean, I hope it wasn't possible because we didn't have that kind of relationship. <laughs> But I got to thinking about memory and a woman with a flawed memory and a man who approaches her with certain data points that are factual. She knows right. that she was in those places at that time, but she doesn't remember him. And is he telling the truth or is he not? So I'm kind of tentatively calling it best boy and trying to make it, you know, as complicated as I can. <laughs> that is so interesting and creepy, I would think, yeah. to get yeah. messages <laughs> like that. Like, thank you for the idea, but also that's creepy. <laughs> it was odd. It was very odd. That is crazy. Well, um, Deborah, that we've enjoyed this so much and um, everything that you've done in Reef Road is so great. And we're looking forward to um, to maybe this book coming to fruition or another book in um, the process. But if um, everyone would love to look at the chat, I'm going to post a link to our next book club next month and have Elizabeth introduce it. Um, and then Deborah, you're welcome also to join because we do this every month and it's, um, oh, really fun. we have people from all over the U S sometimes different countries. Oh, nice. um, for book club. I've heard great things about that. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Our next book is, um, in contention for my favorite book of the year. I, I can say that because I read Reef Road last year. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, but this uh, this was a debut author and I picked up her book and I'm still just haunted by the story. It, uh, and it is Go as a River by Shelley Reed. She is a fifth generation Coloradan, Coloradoan. And um, her book is set in in the natural like the wilderness of Colorado and truly really about a, a coming of age story of a girl growing up in a home full of toxic men there the the women are are no longer there and things happen to her and and it's just it's this haunting gorgeous story and I again it'll be easily one of the best books I read in 2023 and I really hope that everyone will read it and enjoy it and talk to us when we talk to her in April which April the 18th something 18th yes 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 <laughs> April the 18th yes. there you go of course yes so um, um anyway fantastic I can't wait I, we, I've heard so many good things about it and I'm finally I'm ready to read it now that I've read Reef Road I'm ready to read this one for sure <laughs> well, thanks so much again, Deborah. We are just honored that you would join us. And this has been such a good discussion. And we wish you well on your next book. And, you know, we'll be cheering you on for it. Thank you. So lovely to talk to you both. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Okay, I'm going to figure out how to log off. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye, guys. <laughs>